We're still in Leviticus 23. So our first verse is from Leviticus 23, from verse 23 to verse 25. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, On the first day of the seventh month, you are to have a day of rest, a sacred assembly commemorated with trumpet blasts. Do no regular work, but present an offering made to the Lord by fire. And then across to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 through to verse 54. These are Paul's words. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at that last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. We give thanks to God for his word. Now the last four, uh, hang on, three weeks, and then if we go back a couple of weeks to Pentecost, we've been looking at the spring feast. And with the, with the spring feast, we started off with Passover. Right, and that was on 14 Nisan. Okay, I'm sorry. So that was on 14 this and Passover. Right, so let's light the Passover candle. Okay, so that's Passover. And we know that Passover was fulfilled in Jesus. He became our Passover lamb, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. And then we moved along from there, and we had the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that was from the 15th to the 21st of Nisan. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we saw that fulfillment in Jesus being the leaven for us. And no leaven being found. As Paul writes further in, the, in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 8, where he says, keep the feast, but with bread without yeast. In other words, don't have the leaven in your hearts. Don't have the sin in your hearts. Because Jesus took the sin for us. And then it, we move along a little bit, and there was a, a Sabbath in between, then we move to the Feast of First Fruits. Third candle. So the Feast of First Fruits, that's when Jesus rose from the grave. He was the first fruits of those who had died. And we read that, uh, Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians 15. And that was this, the harvest of the barley crop. Then we move across a bit. We have seven full weeks. God gives the directive to Moses and he says, count off seven weeks from here, from the Feast of First Fruits, seven weeks, and then on the, on the 50th day, which is after the seventh Sabbath, celebrate the Feast of Weeks. And we know that is also called Pentecost. And Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came. So Pentecost was a sacred assembly, as was the unleavened bread, as was the, the beginning of unleavened bread, the end of unleavened bread. First uh, Feast of Weeks was also a sacred assembly, a time when the people came together and did no regular work. It was a special Sabbath for them. And we read of what happened on that day at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, where the, the disciples or the apostles were gathered in that room and the wind, the, the Holy Spirit came in as the sound of a wind blowing through. And tongues of fire came on, on the disciples and touched them. And they started speaking the languages of all the other people that were there. And they said, you know, how can this be? We're hearing, this, we're hearing the gospel in our own language. You know, we're not having to listen to, through a translator or I'm not misunderstanding because I don't understand the, the language of the Hebrews. I'm hearing it in my own language. And so the gospel goes out from there. And that's the day that the church was founded. So that's the, the first four feasts of Israel, the spring feasts. And they were a foreshadow of the Messiah. 
So I have to I ask myself then, if this is the case, shouldn't the last three feasts also be the fall feasts? If if Jesus was fulfilled in and through the, the, the if Jesus fulfilled the first four feasts, if they were in him and through him they were fulfilled, shouldn't the last three be as well? See, God is, because God is a God of order. He does things in a specific order for a specific purpose. There's no randomness with God. He just doesn't suddenly one day think, well, okay, I'm going to do this. It's, there's reason why he does things. There's, for us, it would be a planning process. Now, if we plan this, we do it this way, and then this follows because that makes sense and things. That is, how, that is the, the way God is, without even having to think about it. God is a God of order. He does things in a specific way for a specific purpose. And those first three spring feasts were fulfilled by Jesus when he was on earth in bodily form. Those first three, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, while he was in bodily form. And then the fourth one was fulfilled when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, as Jesus said he would send. So what about the, the last three? The, the, the fall feasts, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. They're going to be fulfilled when Jesus comes again. The period between the spring feasts and the fall feasts, so that's from Pentecost through to the one we're doing today, the Feast of Trumpets, it's a period of approximately four months. So now there's this long gap. God hasn't given any directive. They've had their, those first four feasts, and it's all fine. They're happy with that, and now all of a sudden we've got to sit around for four months doing nothing. But that's not the case. For them, as a people, it was a time to continue with the harvests that were coming, with the fruits that were coming to, that were ripening, and, that, and the vintage that was being gathered in. And when the harvest was being reaped, the reaper would leave some of it behind. He wouldn't just take everything for himself. He would leave bits and pieces behind. And we read about that in, in the story of Ruth. When she goes off and, the, and Boaz his field, then Boaz left some bits and pieces for the, the aliens and the, the, the poorer folk that they could come and take that for themselves. And for us as believers in the, the eschatology of God's sovereign plan, in other words, the end times of God's sovereign plan, this is referred to, this blank period of these four months, as the church period. The church period. It's a time when God is bringing blessings to both Jews and the Gentiles. So it's not just for the Jews, focus on them anymore, but it's for everyone, Jews and the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, those ones being strangers to the covenants of, God, of Israel. And how's it happen? By the means of the message of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the spring feasts have been fulfilled, so now we're in that church period. We're in that church period, and we've, we've been in it for 2,000 years. Lord, isn't that long enough? Lord, isn't it time that you, we, we started you know, bringing on these feasts and, and doing things, and you know, getting the ball in motion here? I'm sure for many of us, when I say the word trumpet, with regards to the Feast of Trumpets, you think, hang on, ah, there's a, the gears are working in your mind. Is there trumpets, trumpets? Where have I heard? What's, where have I heard trumpets before? What's, what's the context of trumpets? Where is, it, where is it all happening? But before we look at that, I want us to take a step back and have a look at the Feast of Trumpets for the Jewish folk. What it meant. This feast that was instituted by God and given to Moses, to the people of Israel. What was it all about? Well, in Leviticus 23 and in Numbers 19, we're told that this feast was to take place on the first day of the seventh month. In other words, it was going to be on one Tishri. The seventh month in the Jewish calendar is Tishri. Unlike Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, this feast was to be held on a specific day, on the first day of the seventh month. And whatever day it was, it was to be a sacred assembly, a special Sabbath day 
for the folk to come together and celebrate. And just like the unleavened, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, there was no work to be done other than what was really, really necessary, like cooking food. There, but there were also special sacrifices to be done on this day, special offerings that were to be made in the temple. But why call it the Feast of Trumpets? What's the, where do the trumpets come in and, and what's their purpose in this whole thing? Well, we read in Leviticus 23 and in Numbers 29 that God told Moses that it is to be a day for you to sound the trumpets. A day for you to sound the trumpets. And it wasn't just a once-off thing. It was to be sounded throughout the day. The trumpets were to be blasted. And if we look at Numbers chapter 10, verses 1 through to 10, we read of God's instruction to Moses concerning the making of these trumpets. In verse 2 he says, make two trumpets out of hammered silver. And then there's a whole list of the occasions and the procedures that these two trumpets were to be used for and how they were to be used. And then the major use of trumpets in the Old Testament was to sound the call for the people of Israel to gather, to assemble together to hear the voice of God. Just like it was in Exodus 19, where God said, gather the people together, and when they hear the trumpet, they must come to the foot of Mount Sinai. When they hear the trumpet. Anybody who came forward before that died on the spot. When the ram's horn was blown, the people were to come. In case you're a bit confused, there are two types of trumpets. There's the, the ones made from the ram's horn, which we call the shofar. And I've seen varying sizes. As you can see, this one, this is a tiny one. I've seen some guys have got them uh, in Israel and that, that look like kudu's horns, you know, long ones. Yeah. But that's the ram's horn. It was specially cleaned out and, and treated to be used as a trumpet. And then there's those two silver trumpets that God instructed Moses to, to make that were hammered out of silver. And the ram's horn was used back then, and it's still used today, as a reminder to the Jewish people of God's mercy in substituting a ram for Isaac. Back in Genesis 22, when God told Abraham, take your son and sacrifice him to me as a test of his faith in God. But also, not only is it a memorial to that, but it's also anticipating the end days when a greater lamb would be slain on their behalf. And we know that's already happened. We know it's happened through Jesus Christ. He was that Passover lamb that was slain on our behalf. As, as John the Baptist says in John chapter 129, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, as he sees Jesus coming towards him to be baptized. Can you recall one of the the major events in the history of the Jewish people. Now, they've, they've been wandering around in the wilderness. They've got to the Jordan River. Now they've crossed over the Jordan River into the Promised Land. And there was one occasion where the trumpets were used. You can remember what that is. Yep, Jericho. Jericho. It's the fall of Jericho. And we read about it. It's written in Joshua chapter 6. And we know for six days they were to march around the city one day, uh, once each for those six days, with the priests blowing the trumpets. And then on the seventh day, what seemed like a ridiculous thing, you've got to walk around seven times, and then at the end of that seventh time, the priests were to blow their trumpets, give a loud blast on them, and the people were to shout, and the walls came down. The walls came down. It wasn't the power of the sound that did it. It was the power of God. The obedience of the people manifested through the power of God. But the trumpet played an important part in the life of Israel. And given that the Feast of Trumpets was celebrated even in the times where, where God was not actively proclaiming a new revelation, like in the, the period between Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, and the advent of Jesus in the New Testament, that 300-year period, it would seem that every time they celebrated the Feast of Trumpets, even in that quiet period, there was this anticipation that the Lord God might just reveal himself in power again, especially to consummate the salvation of his people, as we read in Isaiah 27. All fine and well. But what does the Feast of Trumpets have for us? 
Christ is no longer in bodily form on the earth. So how is he going to fulfill it like he did Passover and, and unleavened bread and first fruits? What now? Well, today, the Feast of Trumpets is also known as Rosh Hashanah. And this is marked as the Jewish New Year. Now, do you, are you a bit confused? I've already spoken about New Year. New Year is Nissan. That's the first in this, one Nissan is the beginning of the New Year. Now, all of a sudden, they're saying that Rosh Hashanah, one Tishri, is, is New Year. Okay? There are two New Years in the Jewish calendar. How to be confused. Two new years. The first one is on the first on one Nissan. And that's the, the start of the spiritual new year. The one that God told them to celebrate. This is the first month of your year. When he told Moses as he gave him the orders for the Passover. As they were still there in, in Egypt. And Rosh Hashanah being on one Tishri is the start of the civil year. And this came about as part of the Jews' exile in Babylon, when they came out of that exile. That's when this one came into being. But in the seasonal calendar, if you look at the, the whole seasonal calendar, this marked the ingathering of the harvests that had happened during the year. So we've had the barley harvest, we've had the wheat harvest, and then there were all the other harvests that came along, the various fruits and the other vegetables and things that came. And like with the other feasts, the Feast of Trumpets, you might remember this word, is also a moed time. Do you remember that from the first message when we just did an overview of what the feast was about? And that moed time is a fixed appointed time of destiny which testifies and points to something that goes backwards and forwards through eternity. That's something that points to... Uh, 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 testifies and points to something that goes backwards and forwards through eternity. The Feast of Pentecost, unleavened bread and first fruits, and uh, well, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost literally happened, as we've seen. They literally happened. So there's no reason for us to believe that the Feast of First Fruits will not happen literally, that they will not be fulfilled literally in the future. And I think that we can most definitely say, or I, I feel most definitely that I can say, I believe it will happen in the future. As I said, God is a God of order. He does things in a specific way for a specific reason. The seasonal aspect of the Feast of Trumpets, and I think this is where the light bulb will come on for you, and it came on for me regarding, you know, where have I heard trumpets before? It relates to the end time events recorded in the book of Revelation. Those end time events that are going to happen. And if we look at Revelation, it opens up with the Apostle John hearing the voice of Jesus, which John, which John likens to the sound of a trumpet. He writes in Revelation 1 verse 10, he says, On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. And we know we know that voice was the voice of Jesus because he was speaking to John about the things that were going to be happening. And then in the first three chapters of Revelation, we see that seven churches are addressed. And they cover a period of time which we call, as I've already said, the church age. Each of those churches relates to a specific age of the church since the foundation there at Pentecost. And we're living in that church age still. We're still in it. And I believe that we're in that last church phase, that last church, the church of Laodicea. Read that in Revelation, the, the letter to the church in Laodicea, and see if you can see any similarities of what's happening within the church, what's happening within the world today. And then as we progress further into the book of Revelation, we begin to see the literal fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. Remember I said that in Numbers 10 we read of God's command that you make two trumpets out of hammered silver. And silver in the Bible is symbolic of redemption. And the silver for these two trumpets came from the same source. And that's symbolic of Jesus. 
symbolic of Jesus being the same source of redemption for both the Jews and the Gentiles, for two trumpets. So when the trumpets are blown, all those who are in Christ, Jews and Gentiles, will go to meet him in the sky. Because why? Because both have been redeemed at the cross. The trumpets were used for various different purposes, but God has a different purpose for the church as he does for the, for the, for the nation of Israel. And one of those uses for the, nation, for the Gentiles is the sound to, the, to call the Israelites to break camp, to give up their old ways and to return to the way of God, as we find recorded in Numbers 10 verse 5. But for most, probably all religions in the world, there's a debate about the, the end times, you know, how things are going to happen. You know, what, what's going to happen? Is it everything just suddenly going to disappear? Are we just going to continue on eternally? Or, or what's going to happen? Every religion has got its own idea. You know, we live in expectation that there's going to be an end to this life. And we want to know what's going to happen. When this life ends, what is going to happen? And regarding the trumpet sound, well, Scripture is clear. We will hear the trumpets in the events of the end times. We will hear those trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets in the Old Testament is a picture of what the rapture is going to be like. In our New Testament reading from 1 Corinthians 15, Paul refers to the trumpet sounding the rapture of those who are in Christ, where he says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will all be changed. We will all be changed. And then he, he says much the same thing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. I say, I wonder, when that happens, when I hear that trumpet call, I'm going to whip out my Superman cape, I'm going to put it on, and I'm going to strike that pose, because I want to go like, like in a Superman pose. Ta-da! We don't know when it's going to happen, but we've got to be ready for when it does. The dead will rise, and will be changed, and will go to meet the Lord. But there's no mention of when it's going to happen. There's not even Jesus knew when it was going to happen. As Matthew chapter 24 says, as Jesus says himself, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So not even the Son has been privy to that information. We've got to understand that the trumpets will signal the gathering of God's people. Not just gathering together on earth, but to meet our Savior in the air. And each of the judgments in Revelation chapter 8 and chapter 9 is signaled by a trumpet. And just as the shofar called the nation of Israel together to turn their attention to the Lord and to ready themselves for the, the day of atonement, which we're going to be looking at next week, so the trumpet of God will call us to heaven and warn the world of the coming judgment that is upon them. And so the question remains. What will happen when that trumpet is sounded and believers are taken to be with Christ? Based on your own merit, will you be numbered with the believers? Are you trusting in all that Jesus has done for you? The redemption of your soul, the forgiveness of sins, and the life everlasting with him. To be numbered with those who are caught up with him. It's not on our own merit. It's on what Christ has done for us. The choice is mine. The choice is yours. But when that trumpet sounds, it's going to be too late. We have to know now. We've got to be sure now. We have to have that assurance now. I want to close by reading Matthew chapter 24 from verse 36 to 44. 
No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other one left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken and the other one left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let him let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. And that's our challenge. We need to be ready. We need to be ready when that trumpet sounds that we go to be with Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, we know that you are a God of order, that you do things in a specific way for a specific reason. And we thank you that in these feasts, the first four fulfilled through your son while he was here on earth, the last three we know that will be fulfilled in the future. But today, Father, Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that we need to have that assurance within our own hearts that should that trumpet sound in the next 10 minutes, that we will be with those who are called your own. That we will, we will join those who have been raised from the dead, those who are in Christ alive, up in the heaven, up in the skies, to join our Savior and to go to be with him. But Father, if there is any doubt in our hearts at this time, any doubt, pray that we would, we would turn to you, call on your name, and rejoice in your love, in your grace, and in your favor upon us that we would call out with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. We can't do it on our own. No merit of our own work, nothing that we do with our own hands will be enough for us to have our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. To be able to go with those who are raised from the dead and who rise up when that trumpet is sounded. So Father, if we've got any doubt in our hearts this morning, we pray that that doubt would be removed as we look to the cross, as we look to your Son, our Savior and our Redeemer. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we thank you. We thank you that we can be numbered among those who are going to join our, the, the, the sun in the sky when that trumpet sounds. But Father, our heart grieves for those who will be left behind. Help us to be the witnesses you called us to be. To spread your word and so to bring more into the kingdom of light. Holy Spirit, through your indwelling power, make us bold witnesses. Witnesses to the, the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for welcoming us back into your fold as part of your kingdom. Let us always have that assurance within our hearts 
that we belong to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.